Praise Church. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Good morning, beloved brothers and sisters here at Praise Church. Um, my wife and I are so delighted to be here, even my son. Number two. Sherwin is our number three. Number two is Egan. He's there with us. We are so excited to be here today with you to worship our living and loving God. I trust that all of you are well and strong and healthy together with your families. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. So, what's the plan? We all make our plans for our lives and for our families. These plans were engraved in our hearts, in our minds, the things that we want to do and accomplish, or places we wish to go and visit, or a career we want to pursue, or new things we want to try and experience in life. And we are hopeful that most of our plans, if not all of them, will come to pass. Planning is very good, and the Bible encourages us to plan. But what happens when the, your present, listen, what happens when your present situation in life makes it so difficult for you to achieve your plans or reach your goals in the future? What if your hopes for a better future for your marriage or for your children or for your family seem to start falling apart because of what's happening in your present? The pandemic is still there and nobody knows when will it truly end. So many have lost their jobs and so many business, businesses have closed down. Yes, many businesses have reopened already and many are working again. Praise God. But the economy is still unstable and there's a price spike on everything. I mean, what's the average cost of, of, of a gasoline today? Around 425? Wow. So what do you do? What's your backup plan in case the present situation of our economy doesn't get better any sooner? Or what if the pandemic extends for a little longer, like a year or two or more? Let's say you have a backup plan. Would that plan work in the next five years or 10 or more? Well, here's the good news, beloved. There is a plan mentioned in the Bible that will for sure work in the lives of the people of God. God's great plan. God's great plan. Today we will look into a very familiar passage in the Bible. And, we, and as we hear from God, may His Word bring us new and fresh insights, fresh encouragement about this great plan for us. Jeremiah 29, 11, as we have heard earlier, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Join me in a very short prayer. Our confidence is in you, O Lord, and so we come to you today with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts. You said in your words that your thoughts are not our thoughts and your ways are far from ours. Your word is life and we desire to live in the light of your word. And so I pray, Father, that as we listen to you today, anoint our ears that we may hear, our eyes that we may see, and our hearts that we may understand your message with clarity and power in our lives. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Anoint the lips of your servant. And may the name of Jesus our Christ and Lord be glorified in our midst. 
in whose name we pray all this. Amen. 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 God's great plan. God's great plan. If you have your Bible with you, please keep it turned to, to Jeremiah 29. We will go through it during our time together. Now, just to give you a little background, Jeremiah was originally from the land allotted by God to the tribe of Benjamin. He was called by God at a very young age. Among the prophets in the Bible, only Jeremiah and Samuel were known to start their ministry at a very young age. So Jeremiah basically ministered as God's prophet in Judah, particularly in Jerusalem. Now, God was so specific on what he wanted Jeremiah to do when he first called the young prophet. Jeremiah 1.10 tells us about this. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, as you may have noticed, there are four action words here that in, sense, in a sense are negative. Pluck up, break down, destroy, and overthrow. Now, the book of Jeremiah is predominantly about God's judgment and punishment, not only to Judah, but to all the nations because of their rebellion and because of their rejection of God. Please keep in mind that during those, those times, these four negative things were already underway and happening in the life of Judah and the people of Jerusalem. They were already plucked up from their own country and overthrown as exiles in Babylon under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. Also, the Jewish temple built by Solomon, which was the center of their pride, the center of their honor, the center of their glory, was already burnt, broken down, and destroyed by the Babylonians. Now picture that in your mind. Picture that and imagine, imagine the distress and the pain the people of Judah were going through. They were emotionally, morally, and even spiritually bankrupt. Imagine from fame to shame, from glory to worry, from honor to horror. That, that was the situation of the people of Judah during the time. But that, was plan, that, that, that was part of God's great plan for his people. Verse 4 tells us that God was the one behind their present situation. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, on the positive note, there are also actions of blessings in God's mandate to Jeremiah to build and to plant. And that was also part of God's great plan. But the question is, how will God accomplish his great plan for his children? Now, there are two things I'd like to share with you this morning. The first is this. It is God's plan to bless his people in the present. It is God's plan to bless his people in the present. Who doesn't know Jeremiah 29, 11? Everybody loves this passage. And many have memorized this as their personal verse, claiming every word of it upon themselves, right? If that's you, can you say amen? Few. Amen. Praise God. But I won't be surprised if some of you may say, Pastor Edwin, it sounds a little different today. 
I think the Jeremiah 29, 11 that I know is somewhat different from what I am hearing from you right now. I know. Let me tell you. Let me tell you why. The New International Version render this verse in a way more attractive than other versions. And I says it this way, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Let's be, let's be honest. Many of us would probably prefer this translation over other translations. Do you know why? Because people in general want to be prosperous. I mean, who doesn't? The word prosperity is like music to the ears of many. Let me tell beloved that this version or this translation, listen closely, this translation limits the true meaning of the passage. It limits the true meaning of the passage and we need to know this. We need to know this. Not that God doesn't want His children to prosper. I believe He does, if He wills. But listen, there is more to God's plan than just making His people prosperous materially. There is more to God's plan than just making His people prosperous materially. The Hebrew word used for welfare or prosper in this verse is shalom. Shalom, which means peace. Peace. In other words, the verse is practically saying that God's plan for His people are for peace and not for evil or not to harm them. Now, the word shalom in the Bible has many different usages. It means peace like tranquility or not having war. It also used to refer to a well-being or good health of a person. Healthy, peace, shalom. The word also denotes what? Security. It means rest. It means prosperity. It means abundance. It means abundance. Now, to get a better picture of what shalom is all about, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us an illustration of this when he said in John 10.10, 10, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. Abundantly. A kind of life that is complete and whole and full. A life that lacks nothing. Like what Psalm 23 speaks about. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want Complete. That is God's plan for His people. Plans for peace, not just for material prosperity, but also for their welfare, for their good, for their abundance, for their completeness, for their well-being, for their good health. It is the peace that only God can give. So how would God fulfill His great plan of blessing his people in their present situation. First, God commanded them to be founded, to be founded, to be firm, be established. You see, do you remember the two positive things God commissioned Jeremiah to do? To build and to plant? The Lord is telling them, these are my plans to protect, to preserve, and keep you. Plans for your welfare and not for evil, or not to harm you. Build houses and live in them. In the place where God is sending them to exile, build your house and live in them. God is, God is simply saying to them that make, to make themselves at home. Make themselves comfortable to where they are in the present. I'm sure that we understand clearly what it means to settle in to a place that is new to us. Many of us came from different places, maybe from another city or from another state or 
even another country. And I'm sure that you'd agree with me that settling into where we are right now was never easy, right? Most of us started out here renting or living with friends or extended, excuse me, families. But by God's great plan of blessings, many of you have already built your own houses. And others even have more than one. Praise church. Praise God. Praise God. Build houses and live in them. Now, the next part of God's great plan to bless His people in, in, in the present is for them to, number two, to be fruitful. To be fruitful. Plant gardens and eat their produce. One of the trending activities or habits that happened in the life of many during lockdown is planting a garden. Many have invested their time in gardening and growing all different kinds of vegetables and plants in their own backyard. Amen? We live, on, we live on the third floor of a small apartment somewhere in Eagle Rock. And obviously, you know, we don't have our own backyard. Now consider yourself lucky if you live on the third, third floor of an apartment and... Uh, you have your you have your background with you, so you must be very you must be very rich if you you can consider yourself rich if you are on the third floor of an apartment if you have, and you build your own backyard, right? But I was so impressed with my wife, who was able to grow kamote or sweet potato in our apartment. Can you believe it? Here's how it looks like. And believe it or not, believe it or not, we already enjoyed the fruit of her labor when she harvested some leaves from it to put on her sinigang. Not just once, more than once. Poor kamote. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So plant gardens and eat their produce. It is God's plan for His people that they work and be productive, that they may enjoy the fruits of their labor. We also understand that very well. Some of you, like myself, migrated or exiled by God, if you will, from another country, and yet, we praise God because we are able to work and enjoy the fruit of our labor in the land foreign to us. We have been founded and we are established. Amen? Now moving on to verse 6. The Lord even went further on how they are to be fruitful. Now this is something that is not very popular to many young people of our generation. The millennials refuse to get married. And when they do get married, many of them would rather adopt a dog or a cat than to have a child of their own. What happened to what God says, go and multiply? And that is being echoed here in our passage. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Kudos to Sister Jonah and Brother Noel. Multiply. Hallelujah. The principle here is very clear, beloved. The only way, the only way not to decrease is to increase. And that is to multiply. Be fruitful. Now the same principle applies to the growth of the church in numbers. The only way not to decrease is to increase. And how do we do that? By making disciples. By making disciples, by planting seeds of God's word to people that there may be harvest of souls. There's no other way. 
Next, God's plan of blessing His people in the present is for them to be faithful. To be faithful. They were commanded by the Lord to be faithful to Him in prayer. Even now that they are in exile. And they are to be faithful in praying for the city that they're in. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. May this remind us to continually pray for the city that you live in and for the city where God planted our church. Pray for the city of West Covina and its neighboring cities. Pray for Los Angeles, for the state of California, and for our country. Let us also remember in our prayers our employers and the company that we work for, our bosses and our co-workers. We also pray for our government leaders, regardless of what party they represent. The Lord commands us to intercede for all of them. Why? For, its, for in its welfare and success, we find blessings from the Lord. Then as we see in verses 8 to 9, Prophet Jeremiah warned the people about the false prophets who were living among them. He says, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now, I find this so interesting. This is a constant warning we can find in the whole scripture regarding false teachers or false prophets. They're always present in the lives of God's people to misle mislead and misguide them. They will always try to persuade them to take a different path and convince them to consider a different plan other than God's. They were present in Jeremiah's time. They were present during the time of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were present after resurrection in the life of the church. And they are present even today. And so in the midst of this, God wants His people, is calling out to us to be faithful to Him and to His Word. And we praise God for giving us the Holy Spirit to guide and protect our minds and hearts. And we thank the Lord for giving us the Bible where we can cross-check what, what are being preached, what are being taught in the street or everywhere, online, through the media. Praise God for the Word of God, for the living Word of God. Again, the people from Judah are to be founded, to be faithful and fruitful while they are in exile in Babylon. That is God's great plan to bless His people in the present. And let me tell you, there's a reason for that plan. There is a reason for that plan. Verse 10 tells us more about it. They need to be founded or be established in the land. They are to be fruitful and multiply. And they must remain faithful in prayer and to His word and promises. Why? Because it will take them 70 years as exile in that foreign land. How great is the plan of God for His people. But listen, God's great plan does not end here. Because after that, we see that it is also God's plan to bless His people in the future. To bless His people in the future. God said that He will visit them after what? 70 years to fulfill His promise and bring them back to Jerusalem. Yes, 70 years may be long, right? But that's part of God's great plan. 70 years may be long, but that's not the end of God's great plan for His people. Now, this brings us to our main text. And the second part of Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that it is God's plan to give His people, what? A future and a hope. Now, get this right, beloved. The text is saying that there is hope for the future, not in the future. It means that 
The hope that God gives is available now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not in the future. The hope that God gives is available now in the present. And listen, the hope that we have for the future will not disappoint because the future of God's people has already been set. Do you believe that? So what's the future like for the people of God? Again, verse 10 speaks about, number one, God's promise of redemption. God's own time, He will surely redeem His people from where they are and from whatever situation they may be and bring them back to Himself. God will surely redeem us even from this pandemic of, or from whatever dire situation you may be in right now. Not only that, but there is also, number two, God's promise of reconciliation. Because God will visit His people to redeem them, they will put their trust in Him and call upon the name of the Lord. They will come to Him. They will pray to Him. And God will answer their prayers. They will be reconciled to God. We can also find that there is God's promise of reunion. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. You see, God requires all of our heart when we seek him. And he has promised to be found when we do. And I'm sure of this, beloved, there will be a grand reunion in the future for the people of God. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. I'm excited about that. That would be glorious. Oh, hallelujah. But there is more. There is more. There is also God's promise of restoration. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you. Now, this reminds me of God's faithfulness in the life of Job. If you remember the story, he had seven sons and three daughters. He had so many sheep and camels and livestock, you know. He had so many servants, and he was one of the richest persons in the land during the time. But all these were taken away from him. All his children died in an accident. Not one, but all his children all in the same time. To make a long story short, God restored to him everything that he has lost the Lord even restored him twice as much that he had before. And at the end, he all, God also blessed him with another seven sons and three daughters. Know this, beloved. God, God that we serve, God that we worship, is faithful to keep his promises. There will be redemption there will be reconciliation, there will be reunion, and there will be restoration. God's great plan. God will bless his people in the present, and God will bless his people in the future. That's for sure. That's for sure. Now let me ask you, how, how does your present look like right now? How are you in the midst of this pandemic? What's your situation in your spiritual journey? Or in your job, in your family? What's the present situation in the ministry? How are you coping up with your present? I may not have any idea what your present may look like right now. Some of you may be having problems in your family or in your relationship with your spouse or children or parents or loved ones. Some of you may be going through health challenges. Some of you may be having financial difficulties. Some of you may be struggling with sin that still enslaves you. Some of you may be in a very unpleasant situation in your life and you have been there for the longest. And so you start asking yourself, 
When will I see change? When will I see growth? When will all this be over? Hear me out on this, beloved. Wherever you are and whatever situation you are in right now in your life, know that it's not the end of the road yet. Yes, hardships, sufferings, and difficulties in our lives could sometimes be unbearable. And yes, they may stay for a bit longer. Hopefully not 70 years, right? But like what the psalmist says, weeping may tarry through the night, but joy comes in the morning. God allows you to be in your presence because that is part of His great plan for you. God allows you to be in your presence because it is God's great plan to give you opportunities to trust Him in your presence. And this is what He asks you to do. He wants you to be founded. He wants you to be established in Him as you live in your presence. He wants you to be fruitful. God knows God knows your heart, what you are going through right now, but He's asking you to be fruitful. Know God's will and His purpose, why He allows you to experience the things in your present. Consider your present as God's fertile soil where you could grow more in your faith and in, in your relationship with Him. Be fruitful in the work that God has given you. He also wants you to be faithful. Be faithful in praying that God will be glorified in your present. Now, sometimes I can understand it, it's hard. No? Pray for the good of the place where you are and pray for the people around you. Choose to be a blessing. Choose to be a blessing. God also wants you to know that there is hope that is available for you today. He wants you to know that there is hope for the future because God holds your future. God's plan for you and for me, listen, is to bless us in our present and to bless us in our future. God's great plan always works. Amen? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Listen to me, beloved. God is not guessing. God is not taking chances. God is not doing trial and error. He knows the plans He has for us. Plans for our own welfare and not for evil. To give us a future and hope. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, in you we put our trust, in you we put our hope, because in you we find our peace, and in you we find our strength. We know that your plans always work, and so I pray that may our hearts and our spirit be encouraged by the word that we have heard today. Cause us, O oh God, to trust you even more, knowing that whatever present situation we may have, and whatever present situation we, we may be in, we know that you are here with us and your plan is for our good and not for evil. Embrace your people with your peace and bless us, O God. May the name of Jesus our Christ and Lord be glorified in our lives. This we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.